Hi, everyone. Welcome to the first uh, in the series of webinars for our 2018-2019 year. My name is Diana Sinton. I am the Executive Director of UCGIS, and we're really glad you could join us today. We will officially start the broadcast uh, just in another moment or so um, as people continue to join us. We are very happy today to have Dr. Charles Elschlager from the Engineering Research and Development Center, Construction Engineering Research Laboratory of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And we're going to be hearing uh, Dr. Elschlager talk about observations on the implementation of a general purpose spatiotemporal risk analysis system that supports black swan theory. I know all of us uh, GIS folks are interested to hear how this intersects with our important idea of uncertainty in geographic information science. So with that, I am going to now switch the presenter mode over to you. Chuck, let's see. Okay. Looks good, it's all yours. All right, uh, thank you very much, Diana. Uh, hi, my name is Chuck Elschlager, and um, for the past decade or so, uh, my research lab has been working on what we now call FICUS, uh, which is the Framework for Integrating Complex Uncertain Systems. Uh, my research lab has also been working with uh, Colorado State University, uh, who is being led by Dr. Olaf David, as well as Civil Engineering Department at the University of Illinois. Uh, which is being led by Dr. Uh, Yanfeng Oyang. And um, the, 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 the large purpose goal is to be able to create a computational framework that would allow for many different geospatial and temporal analysis models to interoperate with each other, and then also to provide uh, ways of communicating the outputs of these models to decision makers and planners, many of whom have no idea how to use the GIS. Many of the people that are if we're expected to use these tools, what they know about GIS, they learn by going to Google Earth, and they know very little else. So one of our design goals is to make it possible for people with that limited understanding as end users of GIS to be able to take advantage and, and actually learn about how uncertain the data and the models are, uh, specifically when performing risk analysis. So uh, I'm not going to go ahead and go read anything through this abstract uh, because uh, I'm hopeful you already have all this or you'll be able to look at this later. But the 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 idea is is that our goal is to create a, a tool that can work on any web service or on any computer that would allow someone to be able to operate within a Google Earth-like environment and be able to understand the uncertainty of all the input data to models, uh, the uncertainty of the models themselves, and to provide a visualization environment that makes it easy for them to comprehend how good or bad that data is uh, when, when performing risk analysis. And that's sort of like the big picture goal. And taking a step back, uh, most of you are probably aware with the, the concept known as the data to wisdom continuum. Some people call it the data to wisdom pyramid. But the idea is that we collect data, we build information systems that informs knowledge bases, and supposedly with these knowledge bases, we make wise decisions. And uh, of course, to any cartographer, they realize that that does include reality. The, if you're a real trying to make really good quality decisions, you're basing these decisions off reality, not what our models tell us. We all, we all understand intuitively that models only represent, uh, are, you know, represent a subset of decision making. And so there's a big theoretical challenge that we know that we're only getting a subset of reality in our data, and how do we communicate that uncertainty to the decision makers? So that's so that's sort of like a, a theoretical challenge to all this. Um, and there's another challenge we need to make is the fact that it's 
especially in a very large organization that's distributed around the world, it's really tough for the needs of these decision makers to propagate back to the people who are building the knowledge bases and the information systems and, and also the, the, the sensors that are collecting the data that attempts to represent that reality that we care about. And, and so we're, those are also some of the, the, the weighty things that we need to worry about because we, as the, you know, obviously these tools are mainly being initially built for the U.S. government, but um, the, the, you've got to realize the U.S. government is close to thousands and thousands of people spread throughout the world where you have, you know, ex subject matter experts that are capable of providing very accurate understanding of what's going on in a particular place, but these people are not going to be available to be immediately plugged into the decision makers or the planners in a particular point in time for a specific decision. So those are some of the big picture challenges that we have, and our goal within FICUS is to create a, a, a computing system that makes, that reduces a lot of the barriers to this, this sort of information flow. And we're specifically focusing on the notion of can we perform risk analysis? So uh, risk analysis is a process that is being done literally by thousands of people every day in the U.S. government where you're, you're not, you're, there are people are being asked, give me some options to help solve this problem. Give me the best case scenario, the worst case scenario, the expected scenarios. And now ask yourself the question is that, if people are relying on data they didn't collect, they don't know the uncertainty quantification of that data, how are they able to perform risk analysis in that sort of environment? And the short answer is they can't. So what FICUS attempts to do is to provide explicit uncertainty quantification of the data models. You know, the idea is that all data should have some sort of the uncertainty quantification associated with it, you need to be able to propagate that uncertainty from the various data through the appropriate applications and, and models that you're running, and then you need to be able to visualize that uncertainty in a manner that can be understood by lay people who are not GI scientists. And I would argue if you can't do UQ, UP, and UV, you can't do risk analysis on a quantitative level. And, and my end use case is, is that imagine you have a 23-year-old, uh, very intelligent person who's, who barely, who, who basically knows how to use Google Earth. That's our target audience for that uncertainty visualization, not someone with a master's degree in GI science. So, so these are the sorts of things we're, that we're dealing with. Now, uh, we try to understand, to, uh, articulate uncertainty using black swan theory, uh, in part because so many people within the U.S. government routinely use concepts from black swan theory to discuss uncertainty and risk analysis and decision making. And as a, as a primer, you know, basically black swan events are so unpredictable and improbable that uh, people don't take them into account. You know, it's the, the original notion of a black swan event goes all the way back to the Roman Empire where they basically, someone postulated that, you know, who would ever think that a black swan exists at the time they only had seen white swans. White swans, on the other hand, are, are those events that we expect to happen. Those are the, the expected things. If you were to say what's going to happen to you in one hour, you, if you gave one answer, that would be your white swan event. And then about 2010, Robert Walker came up with the idea of gray swan events. And uh, his definition of gray swan events, nobody liked or very few people liked. Uh, and eventually that, that, that term became to mean those predictable but so improbable events that most people generally don't take them into account when they make decisions. And so that's the definition that we're using. And I would argue that when we represent data and we represent models, we want to be able to show people what, which are the outcomes that are white swans are likely to occur, which things are less likely to occur. And obviously, from a risk analysis perspective, what are the worst case of, of possible events? What are the best case possible events? And now, we sort of also created a term, the swanishness, the swanishness of an event, 
where if an, if, if a, an event is more Grace Swanish, it means it's less probable than some other event. And uh, so the goal is, is that we would want to make it possible for people to understand, you know, have a, a narrative or language that, that helps people determine that. So going, getting back into mind, when we look at reality, reality is, is, is the realm of the possible. So if, if someone's asked a question, what is the literacy rate in this town? You now have a geographic place. We have a geographic time. Uh, if someone, there, we know that there is, is the, a proportion of people that are literate. Maybe you're being very specific. You know, adults um, who, uh, who are working age adults, what is the literacy rate of this town? Uh, one would, you know, there's, there's, some sort of, there's some sort of reality out there that has a specific value, but there's no way that our data is going to give us an, an, an accurate, precise answer unless we went in and we did ground truth of, of that particular place. Now, what our model might provide us is more of what you see on the left-hand side of the screen. You know, your, your model might go ahead and say, well, let's try to represent the, the, pot, the range of the possible as quantiles. So you have the, the minimum likely value, you have the first quartile, the median, the third quartile, and the maximum possible value that our model states. And this model could be a computational model, it could be a, a mental model, you know, just in your own head of what, the, what you think of the range of the possible. And getting back to Black Swan theory, those values around the median of your, median of your model would be those white swans. The gray swans are those things that are near the extremes of what you think is possible, and then black swans are the things you don't think is possible, and but you know might come if, if you really were say proposing a solution that requires a literacy rate above a certain level to be successful. If the, the true literacy rate was below that, your plan would fail. So uh, the the idea is that if you you take advantage of statistical processes by building quartiles, you know minimum first quartile, median third quartile, and maximum. There, you end up with a, a statistical way of testing whether or not your model is wrong. You know, if it, if it, and so we can start getting into ways of testing the quality of your models, whether it's data models or computational models. So a wrong model is any model with a ground truth at any time, the ground truth is higher than the maximum or lower than the minimum of something that you care about. And the beauty is it's very testable. A computer can do it for you. If, if, if your model fails, it becomes wrong in any way, then you must have a mechanism for adjusting or replacing that model immediately. And, and most of you probably heard the, the George Box quote, all models are wrong, but some are useful. But if we're trying to represent reality, that we need to get, we need, we need to eliminate that quote from our lexicon. We need to be able to say, listen, when a model is wrong, it needs to be flagged, and we need techniques that can make sure that when we, when we rerun the model, it, it's going to be able to represent, at least as a gray swan, some of those values that are beyond range of the possible. Now, of course, we all know about what bias is. Uh, very easy to statistically test bias in any data model. You know, are there, is ground truth well above the median or below the median? And there's another concept that, that we're playing with here is the notion of, of model arrogance. Now, we all know arrogant people. These are people who really believe they understand what's going on, and, and they, 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 they're very certain that this is reality, and they become arrogant when uh, basically they, the, the reality is much a greater distribution of, of, of than what they believe it is. And, and you can perform statistical tools that would say if, if the ground truth of the things that you are measuring or estimating, if there's too few, too many data points outside of the interquartile range, uh, then that model becomes arrogant. Or if there's, and if there's, and or uh, conversely, maybe your model is too meek and you're, and you're, and you actually know more than you really do. And, and I'm not saying you have to use quartiles. I mean, you could find, you could come up with the math to do any, you know, by representing, by estimating any, you know, any sort of quantile range. But the idea is, is that it would be great if a computer system would be able to be able to encourage people to collect ground truth, send it back to this computational framework, 
and then be able to immediately tell which data data models and which computational models are being too arrogant or outright wrong so they can be adjusted to prevent the, the chances that there will be black swans or gray swans in reality that you get blindsided with in your decision making. So one of the ways we do that on the data side, so we're talking about uh, uncertainty quantification now here, is that uh, if we want the best way of trying to represent population characteristics is at the atomic scale, and which is the way we collect data in the first place anyway. You know, if you're a social scientist, the first thing you do if you're trying to quantify what's going on in a location is to design a survey or find some way of getting samples of ground truth. And what's beautiful about surveys is, is there's a lot of covariated information in a survey. If you ask someone, a, a you know, like in the USAID measure DHS data set, they ask dozens and dozens of health-related questions where you're getting you're not, you're not just getting, for example, uh, how this household is preventing uh, malaria, but it's also you're getting answers about the economic conditions of that household and the living conditions of that household and, and a whole bunch of other variables, which when, when, when you have all that longitudinal information gives you a lot of intelligence about that, how that household operates. So the goal would be is to build a population simulator that fits the survey information or the microdata from censuses into a way where you're representing every person or household within the study area so that you then are performing your, your geospatial, your temporal analyses on the simulated populations of people. And uh, the, popula the population simulator that we use within FICUS is, is, a, is basically software I've been uh, working on since I was in academia back in the early 2000s, uh, where we now have it set up that all input variables, including forecasting variables, is a stochastic range of possible. So the idea is if we run, if we create many different realizations, if we create a multiverse of populations, these populations, ideally, they will have the range of the possible out to beyond what, what reality is. And, and this process fails if we don't have, if any of the attributes that we're trying to measure when we go back to coming up with sort of doing analysis is doesn't reach the range of the extremes of what reality might be throwing at us. So once you have a multiverse of individuals or households, you can avoid, you can eliminate pretty much the modifiable area unit problem by doing Monte Carlo stochastic analysis on demographic data. So if you didn't have access to microdata or surveys and you're just relying on the aggregated census information that's, that's, ag that's aggregated by arbitrary administrative zones, you might end up with a map that's in the upper middle here. With, and and this, this map here is attempting to understand the proportion of people using tube wells in Chittagong Division, Bangladesh. And, and actually, and just, just as an aside, tube wells is very important because tube wells during a flooding event often get contaminated with the flooded water. So these are people who are used to getting clean water, but during a flooding event like a typhoon or something would end up not being able to, you know, they, they, they lost their access to hot water. If you look at the map on the right, uh, what we did, though, is that we basically said, all right, let's look at the proportion of Muslims using tube wells in 200-meter neighborhoods. And now, if you look closely, you can see where, where there's major roads going through Chittagong Division. You can see the proportion of people using those tube wells decrease un until you start getting out into the, the most rural parts of the division where the proportion of people who are using tube wells also decreased because of, of, of even lower quality access to clean water. And the idea is, is that if, you're, if you have many different realizations of population, you, whenever you say do an analysis at the atomic level, of, you know, in this case you're doing a query on Muslims using tube wells, then you now have a range of the possible values and ideally, the, the graphic that you see here shows, you know, a sort of a box plot and, the, and a stand, uh, mean and standard deviation of the values 
that red at a particular location. And the, the goal here is to, to be able to then be able to take all the different types of queries that you would perform using traditional demographic analysis and turn them into maps. And, and one of the beauties of the tools that we use is, is that every answer to every question of any survey can get turned into a map where the uncertainty metrics of, of the, based on the quality of that survey will then get represented in that map. So that becomes a lot of the population-centric uncertainty quantification. Um, I did my dissertation in the late 80s on uncertainty quantification, and back then we were doing it on digital elevation models and land use maps and whatever because that was easy. Uh, trying to come up with uncertainty metrics of the quality of surveys is a much more computationally mathematically difficult thing to do. If you're interested in the details, go to my paper uh, that was published uh, in 2016. Everything that I talk about is, uh, you can find it by just uh, finding me on uh, researchgate.net and all my publications are, are, are located there. And so, the, uh, so the, the, what you see on the right, this flow chart here shows how uh, you, you do sim the population simulation at the top where you, your goal is to, to come up with accurate first and second order properties of, of each of the attributes in uh, for the, the people in the households in the area. You create a whole bunch of different realizations and then you perform you know, a simple JS analysis. So in this case, uh, the paper goes to an example of looking at wealth and equity between Muslims and Hindus in Bangladesh, where the idea is you look at all the different measures of household wealth on a per person, per household basis, and then you then do a ratio in, in each neighborhood. And, and then the idea is that you have all these different realizations of wealth and equity, and then you perform summary statistics on that. So the idea is that, you're, that you don't aggregate until you absolutely have to as the last step of the operation for communication purposes. Your goal is to always try to uh, stick with uh, the atomic scale whenever possible. Uh, a more complicated analysis uh, would be to try to do what, in a sense, this atomic analysis where you're, you're looking at individual attributes of people, and, but then you're also applying some geospatial uh, capabilities at the same time. So, for example, uh, we built an uh, agent-based model of, uh, to understand the impacts, uh, 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 basically we call it a refugee model, uh, that can be applied to uh, specific scenarios, whether it's refugees from natural disasters or in the case study we did this uh, spring on the Battle of Merari, uh, which occurred between May and October of 17, where the effects are still being uh, hurt. You know, the people in southern Philippines are still being hurt by that. And basically what the way we did that is we identified various subpopulations that would have been affected differently by this battle and then came up with probabilities of whether or not that these individuals and families would end up fleeing to different cities, living in the living rooms of their families and friends, would they be sheltering in place, would they, be, would they, would they have been moved to a displacement camp or did they become casualties? And the way we would go about doing that is you would identify the geographic locations where there was actually, in, in for this model, where there was actual combat, and where, for example, the, uh, where the, uh, w what part of the Philippines would people think it might be a good idea to flee from this, from this combat? And then you identify, based on the subpopulation type, exactly what the, the range of the possible effects that they might have had. So, for example, during this battle, there was uh, uh, there were a lot of roadblocks set up where if uh, adult non-Muslim men were found trying to escape the area, uh, they might be killed if they couldn't cite certain passages from the Quran. So, the probability, if you were a non-Muslim adult male, your probability of becoming a casualty during this conflict just if you lived in the affected zone, was much higher than other people, and you could estimate the probabilities of that. So 
you know, we identified subpopulations, people who were wealthy and had vehicles, people who had access to information, uh, other wealth indicators, first responders had different rates of becoming a casualty and or becoming a victim of other ways. Uh, and, and basically, we would ask, we, we would not just ask the subject matter experts to come up with their best guess estimates of these probabilities, but which, which is actually very painful to do. If you think about it, if I were to ask you any question, you know, what is the percent of people that will vote Republican in Indiana this fall for this congressional seat, whatever number you give, it's bound to be wrong. No one's ever perfect in that sort of thing. But if I were to say, what's the least likely value? What's the most likely value? With a few minutes of searching on the internet, you can probably come up with ranges of values that you feel reasonably confident with. And, and you're only wrong if reality turns out to be a value outside of that minimum and maximum range you chose. So when I was testing uh, FICUS with some soldiers at a war game, uh, they felt very confident that they could come up with, based off of the information they were getting about, uh, because they're basically their day job is to collect information about their speciality, whether it's the food security in Iraq or, or pre preparing for disaster relief in the Philippines, uh, you know, they, they're, they're expected to go out and collect lots of information and become an expert on a very narrow topic and then be able to answer questions on those things. So for, for them, they, if, if given enough information, they don't feel so bad about being able to come up with a range. Now, getting back to some of the theoretical geographic issues that we should really be caring about, uh, you know, we've, we, we all should have learned about the modifiable area unit problem in GIS class. Uh, but uh, Maple Kwan, uh, about a half decade ago, uh, just started discussing a concept called the uncertain geographic context problem. And basically, uh, UGCOP, uh, without going into detail exactly what it means and what it is, is that Basically, the way that reality, people act in reality, it's very difficult for us to model that accurately within our geographic information system. And uh, if we end up taking aggregations of things that don't accurately reflect the decision-making processes and how people move around, our model's going to be wrong. It's going to go off in certain ways. So if you think about the types of GIS tools you are e have easy access to, you know, coming up with simple polygons uh, is, is, uh, is the least effective way it's going to maximize the uncertainty of an, any sort of analysis that is doing these things. Filter functions where you're aggregating attributes into proportions early analysis also uh, are, are, are better than polygons, but you know, maybe not by much. But I would argue that if you become familiar with agent-based modeling as a tool, you can incorporate trafficability on things. I mean, you're, you're, instead of just using, uh, you know, some sort of uh, buffer or filter function as a as a as a measure of distance, uh, you can you can start taking into account supply and demand curves and resource allocation. And you can, if you had access to these tools for building your model and your basically building your model, what do you think this kind of household will do in these sorts of things, you would end up with some very interesting results. So one of the things that's so you know later on we'll we'll talk about this a little bit further, but you know, I uh I on on several occasions I taught agent based modeling at the University of Illinois uh for geographers and you know the the it, it was amazing that with an easy to use agent based modeling system you could do some pretty in incredible and you know, accurate modeling of complex geospatial temporal characteristics. And if, so if you could be able to take an agent-based model and quickly plug it into an other system of models and then be able to see the results, if, if, if you found that is, and it, which is reasonably easy to do with this one semester of education, that model then becomes pretty useful as a, as a what I would consider a more accurate way of of doing a geospatial temporal analysis. 
So the goal here with FICUS is to make it easy to incorporate more and more accurate models in a process where it's where they can be plugged and played and tightly coupled and worked with each other in order to do really cool and interesting things. So we, we've talked a lot about uh, uncertainty quantification. I'm already halfway through my hour, so let's quickly rush through uncertainty propagation. The idea of uncertainty propagation is the fact that, you know, you know, yes, even if you know that all your, you know, we have a, your quantification of uncertainty, uh, you, you know, with a Monte Carlo simulation, yes, you can go ahead and run the, uh, the, 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 any given computational model many times. Uh, but if you, but if you need a way of making sure that uncertainty of the model is incorporated in the variability of the, of the various outputs of that result. And what FICUS did in order to attempt to make this possible is take advantage of the object modeling system, which was uh, built, designed uh, by uh, Olaf David, who is attending this, this, this meeting and is going to collaborate on this research. Uh, basically, the OMS provides a computational framework and allows for to, to, that anyone with, well, anyone knows how to use OMS to easily embed software models and apps written in a variety of different languages and scripts in a way that they can be tightly coupled with each other so that uh, they can all be running on the same platform. And uh, the way that I, OMS makes it easy for programming to allow distributed you know, models written from different people in different places is it, 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 it encapsulates each of these models in a container, which is a computer science term that basically means a tool that runs within a virtual machine. And the o OMS makes it easy to, to make the outputs of some containers become the inputs of other containers. So it becomes a very fast way of tightly coupling a whole bunch of different models together. It doesn't matter what languages the original models were written in. And it doesn't matter what operating system, the computer you're running it on. It all just works magically. So for um, at least to me, it works magically. So the idea is I'm going to be running, I'll show you the Ficus UI. Uh, it's running off of my laptop running Windows, but, you know, you could be going to ficusbeta.erams.com right now and see the Ficus UI running off of a web service. It doesn't matter if it's a cloud, it doesn't matter if it's a high-performance computer. It, it, as long as it runs on a system that, that, um, that they can run Docker or uh, VMware, uh, you would be able to run FICUS in, in these environments. And so the, the way we designed FICUS is that we wanted the ability of making sure that our uncertainty visualization allows us to be able to understand and see the different realities, the realizations of the multiverse that we're running the applications with, summary statistics, we want to be able to see which things are gray swanish. So the way we've designed the interface so far is that, you know, FICUS-related uh, risk analysis tools are available for, for in the upper left, that general purpose GIS tools are located in the upper right, and then any special purpose apps that you want to target specific types of people for are going to are currently located in the lower left. So this goes back to the notion of so so you have someone with a high school degree, still pretty intelligent kid, but um, no training in GIS. That what you want to be able to do is hand them an app that allows them to be able to do interesting analyses uh, very quickly and 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 see the results whether they're working off of a $200 laptop computer or tablet or whatever, because many of these computations are going to be so computationally expensive it requires high-performance computing in order to do. Uh, at this point, I'm going to take a step uh, back and sort of show um, an example of, of this sort of process. So, for example, um, if the refugee model, the idea is, is that if the you know we, we with the way the, the model was designed is that we had two different zones and a zone where people might get scared and think about running away and then there was a zone where there was actual combat happening and things were being damaged 
So the, the easiest, so the, this is basically just a web browser. It could be, as long as it's not Internet Explorer, this will work. Uh, actually, I don't know about Opera, but, uh, but if you have a Chrome or Firefox, uh, that's what we really spend a lot of our time doing. But, you know, anyone could, you know, it doesn't matter what software you have on your machine. You can go and very quickly select a region that, you know, might be the region that people might uh, feel like they're in danger. You know, find, inf you have information about the specific where combat occurred. And then, uh, obviously, as you learn more information about who was being, who was doing what to whom or in a natural disaster, you know, if people don't have electricity, obviously don't have refrigeration, their food supply is going to get damaged much more early. You can do pub, you can do queries on the demographic attributes from your multiverse of people to find out, you know, come up with uh, these types of people are going to be affected in this way by this event, and the which of course is the logic that your, your expertise is going to bring into the field. And then you can compute the model to see which people are going to end up as casualties, refugee camps, sheltering in place, or did they leave the area and are now living somewhere else? And and that would be um, and that would be the the, the goal of, of, of representing uh, the the ability of being able to quickly deploy that model to to anyone uh, would be very valuable in this sort of environment. And so that's so the idea. Is, is that the, the, by using OMS and Katina, uh, we, we make it possible to quickly get models into this risk analysis environment. And now the only problem with uh, this pro process is most models are built deterministically. And one of the things, one of the components we haven't yet finished building yet, if you were, if you were quick, you notice we're only at version 0.6.15. All the, all the things that, in order to turn FICUS into a completely functioning risk analysis tool, uh, we're, we're hoping to have all finished by Christmas, but you know, we're, you're not going to see 1.0 until all those tools exist. The one major tool that doesn't exist is if you can take any OMS component, or basically any bit of software that you've turned into a component by wrapping it around and putting it in a virtual machine, if there's going to, if, if the model doesn't already incorporate uncertainty quantification of that model, this FICUS component is going to have to say, well, the model gives these, whenever it take, gets these inputs, it's going to create this output. We know that there's stochastic behavior. We're going to need the ability of taking, taking output and adjusting it with a random field based on what the model doesn't have. And one of the things you need to keep in mind is that most models, once they become written, become black boxes. You know, FICUS needs to have the capability of identifying when a model is biased or wrong, that you can quickly go in and say, you know what, this model tends to be underestimating what reality is. So let's quickly throw in the ability of throwing having for this output of this model, let's have a random field go in there and make, make the model values come down. And so that's a way where if you have a model, whether it be a flash flood model or electricity disruption model or whatever, there is a way that, that the, the uh, model, the, the people who are, who are combining all these models together as a way of adjusting the quality of the outputs of the components that FICUS is telling you is giving you wrong answers. And so that's a, a bigger goal when you're thinking about the fact that the paradigm we exist in right now is if a model is giving you bad answers, you either throw away the model completely, you don't use it, or you know the model's wrong, but you don't really have an easy way of adjusting it that might make it useful for making future decision making. And, and, and that's one of the things that we want FICUS to be able to do is to make it easier for those people that are building these systems of models together to then identifying which models are too arrogant or wrong and then finding quick ways of adjusting them before without having to say, well, let's just wait for six months until the software designers rebuild this model. 
uh, we don't have time for that in the real world. So uh, in terms of decision making. So basically the way that ficus does uncertainty propagation, here's an example of something that we're implementing right now is that you know, we've already talked in great deal, detail about the multiverse of population attributes that are available. Uh, we also have access to information about uh, many of the infrastructure systems in major cities around the world that's basically available from open source. Uh, if you understand the type of damage that occurs from a typhoon or other natural disaster, you can begin identifying which bridges are broken, which roads are, are impassable, water towers that are busted, uh, you know, power plants that are disabled, things like that. The, the, the researchers at the University of Illinois Civil Engineering Department, they've put together the systems of infrastructure systems modeling tool that, that basically represents all these different net, net networks. And when things break, those those disruptions cascade through the other systems. And uh, because we have representations of every man, woman, child, household in the study area, we use that as the input to trafficability models. So we estimate traffic flow through the cities based off of the transportation needs of the individual household. So going back to the scenario, suppose your tube wells are now all damaged. You now need fresh water daily or you're gonna start feeling pretty bad. That's an additional trip you must now make. So our models can take into account the fact that this is what the traffic patterns used to look like. These bridges no longer work. These roads are impassable. These additional people now need water. Or you could go ahead and do a demographic analysis and say, we estimate that 30% of these people are just going to leave the area as refugees. So these are the sorts of modeling tools that you can create. Now, the outputs to these systems of systems infrastructure models then go into a uh, risk and decision support framework. And uh, let me just go back to the, uh, to, 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 to the FICUS model. Um, the way that we, we want to have data organized, and the way we do so is we use a, a, a data framework called SWET MISO. For each letter of SWET MISO stands for a particular condition. You know, S for sewage, W for water, E for electricity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And your goal is to identify the types of attributes that, that you care about for understanding what's going on during a natural disaster and relief where you then can use either information from surveys or pulling data from Twitter where you're analyzing people's uh, reactions, uh, sediment positive and negative about water availability, and then you're building a framework of information that you then come, you basically determine the quality of the results of the, of the things that you're measuring so that the idea is, is that if you were to perform an analysis, a what-if analysis, using the uh, um, using the, uh, the, uh, the the systems of systems modeling, then that will propagate through the rest of the system, and you'll see uh, uh, the results in the, the the changes in the various living conditions of the people there. So, for example, uh, we've modeled, uh, 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 we simulated the damaging of a bunch of water towers from that, from that fictional typhoon, and that cascades to, to people who rely on grit, uh, water from, from pipes in their water supply, and that would mean more traffic that they have to take. That means that they lose access to water. That's going to be, that's going to end up showing up in the maps down here in the framework, which then can be visualized. And if you if you come up with various plans to uh, fix, so like for example here, uh, this mapping this map here uh, shows you know a simulated of all the damaged water towers. And let's say that you you have a choice of either fixing the southern half 
or the northern half of the water towers within a given time frame, you could then, by running these systems of systems models on both of these, you could be seeing the results and how it affects fuel security and water security and, and other issues that are important in doing in a disaster relief. And so the goal here is you get the subject matter experts who know about the specific models they want to do, you have them collect the data for it, you put them in, but then all the models, because they're all tightly coupled with each other, they're all running and they're going through these processes there. So that's pretty much how um, the, the, the bigger goal of uncertainty propagation works. Um, I really need to give a shout out to the civil engineers over at the uh, University of Illinois. Um, the, 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 their, the, their infrastructure interdependency model they work has, has received design awards uh, from the American Planning Association, and we've been using, we've been exploring this research uh, for the past uh, five years. Uh, the, that then easily gets, you know, we can then plug it into, the, as I said before, the demographic information and to the frameworks to get out of it. We don't really have a lot of time to go much more into depth than to here, but uh, Yen Feng Ouyang is, the, is the, the leader of that effort. One of the things that I wanted to talk about when we talk about uncertainty propagation is the notion that even if you have, if you, you've calibrated and validate, uh, validated a specific model for the test data that you have, um, there is a notion that that doesn't automatically mean that model will be fit for use for any other application. I, uh, in, in the chapter of my dissertation, I talk about this, and other people have, used, have kind of discussed this in detail. I, I call this the heteroscedastic uncertainty verification problem. The, the, the notion with this problem is, and on the right, here's an example from my dissertation. We, I basically did uncertainty quantification of three arc second digital elevation models. And I just said, let's run, run from shortest path analysis across this landscape. So the exact same data model, the exact same computational model, the shortest path, will either give you fit results, the, the bottom one, depending on the start and end location, or unfit results based on the top location. And basically what the color scheme on this map is, is that for those of you who, who uh, you know, this is the mountain ridge just north of Santa Barbara, uh, and basically, depending on where the start and end locations would be, you would choose different routes to go. The optimal route to getting over the mountain ridge will be different. And if you don't understand, if you don't have an exact measure of what the map, the, the DEM looks like, you could have for different start end points either that data being good enough to answer the question or that data not good enough to answer that question. And so the problem, the bigger problem here is there's no way that you can expect, say, the model builders who do calibration and validation for a specific test case will ever be able to guarantee that that model will be useful for any other application. And that's just a single model. So what happens when you have all these models that you can't guarantee, you can't verify for a particular application when they're being jammed together with a whole bunch of other models? The, the argument that I would make here is that you need to come up with an, uh, a, a you, you need to have an environment that is constantly able to test, mm -hmm. validate, the various models appropriated with it. And now the computer science people are arguing for a, manifest, a manifesto for anti-fragile software systems. And uh, I would suggest that without going through all 12 rules of, of anti-fragile software, we need to be building anti-fragile geotemporal analysis tools, where the idea is, is that we, when we want to tightly couple multiple models designed by different researchers where there's often going to be feedback loops into these models. We need a, in a sense, we need a, a framework for integrating complex systems that understands the uncertainty, which is why those words become part of FICUS, 
so that the overall analytic framework becomes anti-fragile. Now, the same guy, uh, Nassim Taleb, who wrote The Black, Black Swan, also wrote the book Anti-Fragile, and, and that book explains the notion of how do you create a, a, a system that is, doesn't, doesn't break the first time anything wonky happens. So, you know, when you talk about black swan theory, when, when a black swan shows up, does your system break down? Or can your system adjust? And ideally, we want FICUS to be that environment that makes it easy. The moment that ground truth is different than our model estimated reality, we can quickly change the framework so that, that we can start still being able to make decisions off that analytic framework. Okay, so finally we get into the visualization side of our conversation. Uh, I'm gonna actually, uh, I'm gonna, uh, if, if you're interested in playing with the software yourself, just go to ficusbeta.erams.com and, and follow the directions that are later on in this uh, presentation. Uh, the one thing, uh, so, but, 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 but I'm, for, for a couple minutes, I'm just going to go through uh, some of the capabilities within FICUS. You've, uh, the idea is, is that whenever you're, you know, whenever you're looking at a specific map within the framework, the way this is designed is that any map that you see, like an, the, this water distribution indicator map, is the product of these input maps. So uh, from the, the point, if, if, you know, if you're, say, a general in charge of a disaster relief mission in the Philippines, uh, you may only care about the condition map, but then you're going to assign, uh, you know, one of your majors to be uh, ensuring that the water production is, is, is back to 100%. And you're going to assign other people to make sure that water is distributed to all the people. And so you end up with different metrics for determining success of each of these different things. And the idea is, is that you'd want to be able to go through and look at maps as, they, as they've been applied to various analyses. So here, um, the, if you're just looking for quick summary statistics, um, if you can, you know, as I said, you have the minimum, first quartile median, third quartile maximum values of all the different model runs that were performed on that data. Um, it, this basically one rep, you know, if something you see is dark blue, you're, you're seeing the best possible metric, things that are red, it, you know, go ahead and ignore the, um, you know, the, the uh, refugee model data that's, that's located here now. Uh, you, if you wanted to look at individual realizations, you can see which data realizations are the most unlikely expected values of, in this case, being the metric for the quality of your laundry and bathing water source. So by you can go ahead and be looking at the realizations. You can see which of these realizations are most different from the expected. And if you're doing risk analysis, you're going to see immediately the best and worst case scenarios. And then as you move on in the animation, you're going to start seeing the, 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 the realizations that are most expected to be close to the, the, the median. You can be doing uh, temporal analysis here. Uh, it, uh, this, this, uh, whenever you have space-time data, you could be either animating off of the realizations or the, the uh, distribution of possible reality, or you could be animating on time of the day. So like this is a map of the average speed, of, a simulated average speed of, 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 the, of vehicles traveling through Manila. Uh, as, as, I, as I move the slider throughout the day, you're getting, uh, you're, you're showing the effects of the, of the road network. I think that recently Manila uh, just beat out Lagos as the most, the worst traffic city in, in, in the world. I don't know how true that metric is. It, you know, it's done, you know, you, I read it off the internet, so it must be true. But um, the idea is, is that um, because our, the models that we've incorporated in here allows us to, to if, if we know a bridge is broken or roads are flooded, we can shut down those links in the trafficability network so that 
well, then we can rerun the model, and now people are going to be forced to find alternate ways of getting their food, getting their water, um, and 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 based off of the the model parameters that were chosen. So uh, the idea is is that we want people to very quickly be able to see best and worst case scenarios of the types of information they care about, whether it's down in the details, like the, a metric for specific, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, drinking water, or if you are looking at sort of a high level map looking at the overall condition of water quality uh, given a certain event. And uh, I did touch upon this earlier. This software is designed that if, let's say that you have five different maps open up at the same time, you can use uh, this linking and brushing software to create a session where panning and zooming and mouse clicks on one map will then propagate to these other maps. And it's not just your maps. The goal here is that once we get the multi-user version of this working, if you have a data set on a server and you have people in the Philippines on that server and people uh, at, in Hawaii who are, who are directing uh, disaster relief, and you have people in DC, like the Department of State, USAID, they all could be looking at the same set of maps, watching this collaboration of panning and zooming and analysis in real time with each other. So, uh, you know, like right now, we're doing a VTC, or you know, we're basically doing a teleconference uh, all over the United States and some other UCGIS institutions uh, outside of the U.S., but we have very limited bandwidth. You're only, you know, we're only showing you one screen on my computer. We could literally have a whole room full of screens off of multiple computers all operating dozens of different maps in real time in this collaboration mode. So those are some of the things that, uh, that we're trying to achieve within FICUS. So uh, closing remarks. Um, if, we're, if, you, if you use uncertainty quantification, propagation, uncertainty visualization at atomic scale, you can eliminate the modifiable area unit problem. You can reduce the uncertain geographic context problem, but to eliminate it, you're going to need to be using application-specific options like agent-based modeling that are not found in legacy GIS. Um, I, the, the, uh, the head of scholastic uncertainty verification problem gets reduced if you adopt an anti-fragile Oh, my email address is wrong on here. There's an L in there. Uh, yeah, this is not going to get to me. Um, you know, check, you know, check the spelling. Uh, my, the, my, my name is spelled wrong on this, on this email address. But uh, the, uh, until you adopt an anti-fragile systems of modeling approach, you will never be certain that you can verify the quality that, 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 that a set of models will be fit for use. Um, ideally, these techniques provide for reasonable risk analysis and making it clear, uh, ideally, that people know the difference between the range of a model, the gray swan, the gray swan, best, the worst, versus the range to reality. Um, right now, my research lab is is hiring. If uh, if, you're, if you have strong computational statistical skills and love doing geotemporal analysis, contact me. If you're thinking of doing some collaborative research in this domain, contact either uh, myself or uh, you know, Dr. David uh, uh, at Colorado State for opportunities to, say, work with the system. Um, uh, I know that I've taken up the entire hour. Uh, hopefully, there will be time for a few questions, if, if, and I'll, I'll hang around as long as you do. Chuck, thank you very much. That was fascinating, and I know that there was a lot of eager attention paid by researchers and grad students listening over the last hour. We are at the top of the hour, um, but if anyone has a question that you would like to type in to the chat space uh, or the question space. We'll make sure that these 
um, if we're able to get to one now. Otherwise, uh, you you have. Um, I will make sure that everybody has uh, Dr. Elschlager's correct email. And as a reminder, too, this session has been recorded, and we will be. Uh, I'll be processing the recording, and you'll be getting an email with a link to the recording tomorrow. So, any anyone want to type a? If you've got a something that could be a quick question for the benefit of the group. Feel free to do that. I know there's still some attendees here listening intently. Otherwise, Chuck, uh, Chuck thank you again for your time. I, it was very generous for you to share this with us, and it's it's um, truly fascinating, and it's excellent to see the uh, geographers out there doing work like this. Oh, thank you very much, Diana. Okay, everyone. Oh, we just do have one quick question here. Let's see if I can open up my screen enough to see this right now. Uh, Chuck, you might be able to see that question too. I'm just having a, uh, I'm just I, having a difficult time opening up this question. I, 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 I unfortunately, there's. I'm not seeing any anything yeah. in chat right now. Hold on one quick. Um, so this model is currently working on places where your lab has infrastructural information and census data. Uh, unless people are using their own data and bringing it into the system. So I guess the question is about the, um, the current uh, collection of data and the sources of data where it's coming from. Okay, so um, the Big picture wise is that right now anyone could use the ficus UI um, and assuming they follow all the instructions and probably get some help from, from Colorado State or, or, or University of Illinois or, or, or Erdic, uh, you, it, you would be able to bring your own models in. In regards to data, um, the uh, systems of systems infrastructure model requires Pretty much a massaging of the data to get into that specific data format. Uh, the the data that we use is uh, there's an organization with U.S. government that that collects this data, but that doesn't mean that uh, that that you if you had an infrastructure network that you would be able to get that into uh, the civil engineering department's uh, framework uh, and get that in. The the demographic modeling tool. Basically, the, the construction of simulating every man, woman, child, and household is, is either as straightforward as there's some R scripts that you can download where you take, uh, you know, IPUMS data or surveys and then given uh, aggregated uh, enumerated data from census, you could quit, within five minutes build a population model. The population model that we use uh, takes a, does a lot of uh, spatial clustering. It can incorporate uh, information from ground truth and things like that. So these our models can potentially be way more accurate than a quick and dirty. Uh, let's just simulate this questionnaire, you know, 80 million times for everyone for everybody in Bangladesh. Um, so the I, and it, unfortunately the building that demographic model of every man, woman, child, and household is probably the most computationally expensive part of the process and has to be done beforehand. Uh, but once that is built, then all the power of all the covariated attributes and whatever, you're, you're, you're basically creating a bunch of GIS data layers equivalent to the number of answers to all the questions in the survey. And that's before you start doing combinations of attributes that you care about. So there's a lot of bang for the buck once you've built the model. And of course, you just can't hand out this data. You know, when, when I got the data from the Philippines and Bangladesh from University of Minnesota, IPUMS, uh, they're in, uh, you know, I, I can't just hand that data to other people. Now, conceivably, there's no reason why I can't hand the maps the, the outputs of analyses to other people. And the way the FICUS UI is designed is that 
uh, I can have the data on, on some sort of server, perform an analysis using the tools that you see on the screen right now, where you're seeing the final maps, but you never got access to the original raw population data. So that would uh, maintain the uh, potential uh, guarantee privacy of the original data and not doing anything that would be breaking any terms of use. So, so yes, you need the data. You're going to have to build the data beforehand. Um, but re the, the reality is, is that you could be, pref once you get into the paradigm of saying, any data layer that I want to build, I need to build a whole bunch of realizations of that data layer where somewhere within those realizations, the, the, the range of the possible of that attribute and the, is going to exist in that model. So your goal is if, if reality says at a particular place, if this particular attribute can have a value anywhere between here and there, if you build a way of building your data model that takes that sort of, here's you know, most like a DEM, you typically get, here's my best guess what the value is. Here is the standard error that gives you a plus or minus. That turns into statistical distribution. You make sure you have spatial dependence so that the errors at one place are similar to the errors right next to it. And then you make sure that your model is reasonable. You now have a way of, 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 of doing uncertainty quantification of that particular data layer. I'm, I'm, obviously, there's a lot of hand waving. And you know, I've been doing uncertainty quantification since the 80s. So um, it's not a trivial thing. But from a big picture point of view, if you go to NASA and download imagery from their satellites, there's uncertainty quantification metrics built into all their products. So it's not that big of a stretch to, to say, let's start, instead of just giving a best guess plus metrics, why don't you deliver realizations in a multiverse of possible values of that data product? And that's what the U.S. government should be doing. And your work is a great next generation towards that. Okay, thanks. Oh, thanks. Everyone, we will uh, wrap this up now. Thank you again for attending. Stay tuned for other webinars in our 2018-19 series to be announced soon. And uh, thanks for your attention. And thank you again, Dr. Elschläger. And uh, we'll be signing off. All right. Thanks again. Thanks, thanks Anna, for organizing this. Yep. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.